left for the last. Um, our first speaker is Yang Quan. Um, he received his Bachelor of Computer Science a degree from Pohang University of Science and Technology in 2017. He's currently pursuing a PhD in the School of Engineering, uh, Electrical Engineering at KAIS under the supervision of Prof. Ming Su Ru. His research area focuses on hardware software co-design for machine learning. Um, let's welcome the speaker. Hello, everyone, can you hear me? So let me start the presentation. Hello everyone, I'm Young and Guan from KAIST. Today I am going to talk about training personal knowledge recommendation systems from GPU Scratch. First, let me introduce the research scope of this work. Now, it is well known that the deep learning-based personal life recommendations are widely applicated in the various online services, such as YouTube, Netflix, Facebook, and many others. Since it has very large variety of applications, now there are huge interests on how to train and deploy these models efficiently. For example, according to recent Meta's announcement, 50% of AI training computation and 80% of AI inference computation are consumed by the recommendation models in their data center, which highlights the importance of optimizing recommendation models. In this work, we focus on accelerating these recommendation models, especially for the training side. Let me briefly introduce the model architecture of these deep learning models for the recommendations, so-called DRM. Deep learning recommendation models mostly consist of two parts, embedding layers and DNN layers. Embedding layers are used to learn unique features of each categorical input, such as features of individual users and items. Using those learned features from the embedding layers, the final prediction of preference is made by the DNN layers. In these kinds of models, since the embedding layers are designed to learn unique features of all the individual users and items, it is known that for the large scale recommendation models, the size of embedding layers can easily exceed GPU memory capacity, which causes unique system level challenges. For these reasons, it is common to use a hybrid CPU GPU system for training large recommendation models utilizing both CPU and GPU. In the hybrid CPU GPU system, embeddings are stored inside the capacity optimized CPU memory while kept leveraging throughput optimized GPUs for compute intensive DNN layers. In this approach, the CPU embedding parts become a major system bottleneck. This is because the key primitives of embedding layers are highly bandwidth intensive operations while CPU memory provides much lower bandwidth compared to the throughput optimized GPU memory. This figure shows what exactly happens in the embedding layer. The input, in, input data is embedding table indices we want to gather from the large embedding table. The embedding layer is just doing a simple vector gather operation that copies embedding entries into a contiguous memory address space, which is an extremely memory bandwidth intensive operation that GPUs are good at. In these circumstances, to mitigate the CPU bottleneck, it is natural to think about a caching approach that caches frequently accessed hot embedding entries within the fast GPU memory. There were a few prior works of literature utilizing these kind of embedding caches using GPU memory. However, it is not yet been discussed a lot for embedding cache itself and how should we implement these caches in real systems. Our research provides a solution to this question. From now on, I will introduce the most important key observation of our research that enables our performance effective embedding cache design for recommendation training. First, let's recall how the conventional caches work. For the conventional caches, there were replacement policies such as LRU or LFU to manage a cache. The, the eventual goal of replacement policies is to predict future accesses, which is unknown. So caches are general, generally designed to utilize past cache access patterns 
to make educated guesses on what may happen moving forward. So for the conventional caches, doing speculations on future excesses and wishing for opportunistic hits was the only option we had. However, we make the key observation that the for the recommendation training purposes, we don't necessarily have to rely on past history information to predict future accesses. For the recommendation model training, we can precisely know the future data accesses because the input embedding table indices are the exact access location of the embedding table. Since the input indices are generated by the given training data set, which does not change during the entire training process, it is possible to precisely know all the embedding access patterns for the entire training process. So for the recommendation models caching system, we can freely utilize feature access information to enhance the caching system, such as implementing Bellatis optimal cache replacement algorithm or implementing a per perfect prefetching mechanism that captures all the future accesses. Based on this observation, we propose a cache that always hits on the access time by implementing a future access pattern aware perfect prefetching mechanism. Since our caching system ensures every embedding vector that is required for training is already stored inside the cache at the actual access time, it provides an illusion of GPU on your training that everything is stored inside the fast GPU memory. Before going into details of our proposed architecture, let me first present a naive Strawman cache architecture for recommendation training to point out the important research challenge this paper innovates in. To be able to prefetch the future access embeddings, the cache requires the ability to dynamically replace its entries at runtime. So first, through this example, I will explain how a software manages dynamic cache works. In this example, there is a main embedding table in the CPU memory and an embedding cache in the GPU memory stores the up-to-date embedding values. In this example, we are trying to access the input indices 1, 4, 5, 7, and 8 for this training iteration. In the case of training using a dynamic cache, one training iteration can be divided into five steps, four steps for cache management and one extra training step. I will briefly explain those one by one. For now, just forget about the prefetching and assume we are just performing this iteration on demand. I will cover the prefetching part later. Now, the first part is the query stage. In this stage, the given input indices are classified whether it's hit or missed. For missed entries, it needs to be fetched from the CPU embedding table to the GPU embedding cache. To store the fetched embedding entries in the cache, it needs the same number of free slots. So the same number of entries should be evicted from the cache and must be backed up to the CPU embedding table. So the victim selection process is also performed in this stage. Next is the collect stage. In this stage, the embedding gather operation is performed for missed entries currently in the CPU and victim entries in the GPU selected from the query stage. Next is the exchange stage. In this stage, the gathered entries are transferred to the destination side via the PCIe channel. Next is the insert stage. In this stage, Cache entries are replaced by the fetched entries, while the evicted entries that contains up-to-date values are written back to the CPU embedding table. Last is the train stage, which performs the SGD training algorithm. At this point, all the caching operations are done. We have all the required embedding entries inside the GPU cache for this iteration. So the training stage itself can be done as the same as GPU only training, which will be an order of magnitude faster than the traditional hybrid CPU GPU training. However, in our sequential single ex iteration execution, high over CPU embedding operations are just moved to cache management steps. They are not disappeared. In other words, if we can hide all the cache management overheads, 
we can perform the end-to-end -end training process at a GPU-only training speed. Now it is time to discuss how to prefetch future inputs and hide these cache management overheads in actual training iterations. The prefetching future inputs can be interpreted as a pre-computing these cache management steps for the future input batches. And to do that, we can do pipeline execution of these stages of the current and future input batches. That is what our Strawman architecture is trying to do. This is how the pipeline execution will look like. In this figure, all the five stages of different input batches are executed in parallel to hide each other's latency. However, although we can improve performance this way, there is a problem here. <clears throat> Sorry. Reminding what those cache management stage are doing, we can notice that we are trying to fetch and evict embedding entries of the future time step in this pipeline execution. This means the up-to-date value of prefetching and pre-evicting embeddings may not be ready yet in the current time step. We can also understand this problem as a read after write data dependency problem of the pipeline execution. This figure shows the data dependency of the collect stage in this pipeline at the training iteration I plus four. Let me explain why this kind of dependency occurs. In the iteration I plus four, it is performing the collect stage of batch I plus three, which will be used in the train stage of three later iterations. Since embeddings are kept updated through following training iterations, the currently fetching and evicting entries have a risk of becoming outdated by the time it is actually used. So to guarantee functional correctness, these stages cannot be pre-executed and must be executed sequentially. The worst thing is, this was just showing one of many other data dependencies. There are many other data dependencies considering evictions and operations in other stages. So without, without a dependency resolving mechanism, our Strawman architecture has no option but to execute in serial to guarantee functional correctness. <clears throat> our final proposal, ScratchPy, solves all the dependency problems encountered in Strawman architecture that enables fully pipeline execution. We named our proposal as ScratchPy as our proposed solution utilizes the GP memory as a fast scratch pad memory to store the hot embedding entries. The key to resolving these dependencies was to be able to be aware that the GP embedding caches always contain the latest values. So by not evicting the cache entries that will be accessed in the near future, it will guarantee that the GPU is always accessing the latest value. As we have future access information and freedom to choose victim entries, it is possible to implement this restriction in a replacement policy. To implement this idea, we replace the query stage of the Strawman architecture to the plan stage that employs a future access pattern aware prefetch pre and eviction algorithm that can resolve all the aforementioned data dependencies to ensure the functional correctness of pipeline recommendation training execution. Due to the timing constraint, I will not go over further implementation details. Please refer the paper for the detailed explanation. Now I will explain our evaluation methodology. For the evaluation, we use the NVIDIA DGX 1V system, which has two Intel Xeon CPUs and eight V100 GPUs. We implement our evaluation system using lower level PyTorch C++ API and NVIDIA's performance optimized libraries. The core part of the scratch pipe was implemented by custom CUDA implementation and NVLAB's CUP library. We evaluated three different systems, the hybrid CPU GPU without embedding cache, the Strawman architecture as a current state of the art ca embedding cache that is executed in Serio, the last system is our scratch pipe, executing recommendation training in a five-stage pipeline. Since our systems are implemented purely in software, 
We measure end-to-end roll clock time for all evaluation results. For the benchmark models, we fo follow the configurations of the MLPerf benchmark since the performance of the cache, cache system is significantly affected by the input access patterns. We evaluate four different input access patterns, one random access, and three other access patterns generated using real-world data set. <clears throat> this figure summarizes the evaluation results, which show the entry and training speed up normalized to the hybrid CPU GPU's performance. Our evaluated systems are shown in different color. The x-axis shows the different cache size and different input data locality. Our scratch pipe solution achieves average 5.1 time speed up compared to the hybrid CPU GPU and 30 to 60% speed up compared to the Stramen architecture. We have also compared our proposed system with model parallel training that uses multiple GPUs. To we calculate the estimated price for the multi GPU system and our single GPU scratch pipe system for training 1 million iterations, assuming AWS GPU instances are used. Since the multi GPU solution can leverage multiples of GPU HPM vendors, it can achieve lower iteration latency. However, our scratch pipe solution can achieve two to six times lower iteration per dollar, achieving significant improvement in the total cost of ownership. To, to summarize the, the presentation, we propose Scratch Pipe, the first application specialized performance optimized caching solution for sparse embedding layers. Our solution only requires software modification, while it can bring significant performance imp improvement on important AI workloads. Overall, our solution achieves an average 5.1 times higher performance than the prior hybrid CPU GPU system. Thank you for paying attention to this presentation and I will be happy to hear any questions. All right, um, if no questions, um, I have a question. So it's a Pure software-based approach, right? Doing the prefetching. So yeah, for for any program that want to use this technique, is there what's the interface to use it? Like, is there API that's exposed uh, for any program to use it, or it's basically deployed on the CPU side that basically underneath oh. the yeah. Oh, those those under the PyTorch. Yeah, yeah, those core part of the cache management stuff are implemented using the CUDA. So I did like custom CUDA implementation for that. And those CUDA code is just work like software runtime and those are managing everything for this, this project. Cool, thank you. All right. Um, our second paper is, oh, let's thank the speaker. Um, our second paper is going to be a, a virtual presentation. The author cannot get the visa and make the trip. So he is going to be on Zoom answering questions, but we will play a video for his talk.
Peking University. Today, I will give a talk about our recent work, AMOS. This work is done with students from Peking. University and Stanford University, and researchers from Sansheim Research and Shanghai Air Lab under the supervision of Professor Yunliang. We are now in a golden age of computer architecture. With the proliferation of accelerators, hardware specialization becomes a major source of speed up. Representative accelerators include TPU from Google, TensorCore from NVIDIA, and Assign NPU from Huawei. We call these domain-specific accelerators spatial accelerators. The spatial accelerators are composed of many cores that share global memory. Within each core, there are many subcores that share Anchi buffers, and each subcore is composed of a P array. The PEs are organized in spatial architecture to implement specific tensor computations in hardware. Typical examples include AVX units, tensor core, and matrix multiply units. We use the spatial accelerators. A special programming interface is required, which we call intrinsic. There are two types of intrinsic. The first is compute intrinsic. Compute intrinsic is used to perform a vector or matrix computation in a packed manner. And the second type is memory intrinsic, which is used to prepare the packed data for compute intrinsic. Currently, there have been two kinds of approaches of making workloads to spatial accelerators. The first is hardware-aware mapping. It directly maps the software iterations to physical keys without using the instructions. For example, we can map the small matrix multiplication to a 3x3 P array in an output stationary manner by setting the space-time and time step correspondingly. However, for most accelerators that only provide intrinsics for programmers, we have to adopt another methodology that is called SR-aware mapping. For example, we need to replace the original loops of matrix multiplication with a tensor core intrinsic when mapping to tensor core. There has been a lot of literature on mapping software to spatial accelerators. For hardware-aware mappers, representative works include TOSA, SERA, and Hasoko. For SR-aware mapping, representative works include AutoTVM, ANSWER, and UNI. We focus on the SR-aware mapping. The previous work on SR-aware mapping is limited in two aspects. First, they provide no uniform abstraction for hardware, and second, there is a lack of the understanding of the whole optimization space. In detail, this hardware mapping can be challenging. First, different accelerators provide different intrinsics. To map the software to these accelerators, the programmers have to rewrite their code again and again, which is tedious and error-prone. Even though many different accelerators implement similar functionalities such as matrix multiplication, such repetitive work is unavoidable because of the lack of the uniform abstraction. Second, there can be various choice about how to map software to intrinsic. The complete mapping space is in trouble and it's hard to tell which mapping can bring the best performance. For example, here we list two choices to map a 2D convolution to tensor core. The first choice unpacks the original input image so that the pixels in Y sliding window can be put in one row and the unpacked image become a large matrix, which can be mapped to tensor core for matrix multiplication. This mapping is known as image to column transformation. And the second choice is to split the original image into nine different matrices. Each small matrix can be mapped to the tensor core independently, and the final result is the sum of the, all the partial sums. This mapping is known as fuse HW transformation. There are also other mapping choices. Actually, Amos can find totally 35 different mappings for this example. To address all the challenges, we propose Amos. The input to Amos is composed of two parts. The first is the software part. The user should describe the high-level computation in SCALA format. And the second is the hardware part. Amos requires abstraction for hardware intrinsic. The hardware abstraction serves as an intermediate representation for compute intrinsic and memory intrinsic. AMOS can use the abstraction to generate mappings for input software. To filter out the invalid mappings, AMOS further uses a validation algorithm to check whether the generated mapping conforms to the original program semantics. The remaining verified mappings along with other optimizations such as tiling and unloading form a large design space to explore.
AMOS uses a combination of the performance model and the learning algorithm to explore the large space. Finally, AMOS generates low-level code according to the best mapping from the better exploration part. To introduce our hardware abstraction, let's first focus on the abstraction for compute intrinsic, which is called compute abstraction. The compute abstraction expresses the computation logic of an intrinsic using the data race and the indices. Usually, the iterator indices are bounded because the problem size of intrinsic is fixed. Take TensorCore as example. We show one MMA sync intrinsic computes a 16 times 16 times 16 matrix multiplication, which can be expressed in three loops. Our compute abstraction for TensorCore is shown in this slide, which captures the nested loops in one expression. Then, let me introduce the abstraction for memory intrinsic, which is called a memory abstraction. The memory abstraction captures the behavior when loading data from one level of memory to another level of memory. In addition to the dating arrays and the accessing indices, other information such as the scope of memory, the loading stress, and the base address is necessary. Take TensorCore load matrix sync intrinsic as example. The hardware abstraction is shown in this slide. We use a flag to indicate that the destination is a register and the LDA is a loading thread. There are iterations in both software program and hardware intrinsic. For example, there are seven iterations in the 2D convolution, and there are three iterations in the TensorCore intrinsic. Besides, the iterations can be divided into two types, the spatial iterations and the reduced iterations. Spatial iterations indicate the loop iterations have no dependency, but the reduced iterations indicate that there are right after right dependency between the loop iterations. Based on the definition of compute abstraction and memory abstraction, we can formally define the mapping from software to hardware. We define software hardware mapping as a pair of two mappings. The first is compute mapping and the second is memory mapping. Memory mapping is determined by the compute mapping because memory mapping is responsible to prepare data for compute mapping. Here we show an example of software hardware mapping that maps a 2D convolution to TensorCore. We can see that the software iterations N, P, Q are mapped together to the hardware iteration I, and the software iteration K is mapped to the hardware iteration J, and the software iterations C, R, S are mapped to the hardware iteration L. This mapping corresponds to the image to column transformation. There are usually various different mappings for one pair of software and hardware. For example, we have introduced the image to column mapping and the fuse HW mapping in previous slides. Our hardware abstraction is general enough to express these two mappings. Moreover, we can find there exist other mapping possibilities, which are not revealed in previous work. For example, the third mapping in this slide maps different software iterations to hardware iterations. The software iterations not used remain normal loops. And this observation implies that our hardware abstraction opens a new space of mapping design and enables more mapping possibilities that are not explored in previous work. To generate the complete mapping space is hard because there are various constraints in software and hardware intrinsic. To solve the problem, we adopt a two-step generation process. For the first step, we call virtual mapping. We view the target hardware as an ideal hardware that has no constraints on intrinsic program size and memory. So the hardware can only perform three operations, the first load, second compute, and final store. Then we enumerate uh, mapping from software iterations to hardware iterations and directly enroll all the mapped iterations to hardware. For example, if we use image column transformation for 2D convolution on TensorCore, we will obtain a large matrix multiplication because we assume the hardware can accommodate all the data in on-chip buffer and the intrinsic can complete all the computations in one shot. But the actual constraints are not considered, such as the uh, censorship, the memory limit, and the intrinsic problem size. In the second step, physical mapping, we need to bring back the constraints of the hardware. For the mapping example of 2D convolution, we need to split the huge matrix multiplication into small pieces, and each piece corresponds to one tensor core intrinsic invocation. The size of each piece is determined by the intrinsic problem size, and the input data size is determined by the memory capacity. We need also consider the trading padding because the data shape may be not perfectly divisible by the problem size. Although we can generate more mappings, not all mappings are valid. We show three invalid mapping examples in this slide. 
the first mapping maps uh, reduce iterations to the spatial iterations that maps uh, R to J. And the second mapping maps uh, spatial iterations to the reduced iterations, maps uh, P to L. And the third mapping maps uh, iterations N, K together. You know, N and K access uh, tensors in different manners. So mapping them together will result in incorrect data. To capture all the invalid mappings, we need first to capture the memory access patterns of our input program. For clarity, we use a blue matrix to represent the memory access details. For example, in the 2D convolution program, there are three tensors and seven iterations. So we can use one three times seven matrix to indicate which iteration visits which tensor. The value one at row I and column G means that the iteration of column G is used to access the tensor at row I. We denote this blue matrix as a software access matrix. Similarly, we can get the access matrix of hardware intrinsic. Second, we can also use blue matrix to represent the software hardware mapping. We put software iterations in columns and the intrinsic iterations in rows. The value one at column J, row I, indicates that the iteration from software at the row J and the iteration from the hardware at the row I are mapped together. We call this matrix Y. Using the three goal matrices X, Y, Z, we can check whether a mapping is valid. All we need to do is to check whether the following equation is true. In this equation, we can view the matching matrix as an agency matrix that relates software iterations with intrinsic iterations. And X times the transpose of Y produces an access matrix that captures how intrinsic iterations visit the software tensors after mapping. This is expected to be the same as the inherent access pattern of the hardware intrinsic, which is represented in matrix Z. After generation and validation, we get a large mapping space. To explore the space, we use genetic algorithm combined with a cost model. The exploration starts with a set of randomly sampled mappings. These candidate mappings are evaluated by our cost model, and the low performance mappings are filtered out. Only the top key mappings are reserved. These reserved mappings are then evaluated by the hardware profiling. The temporary best mapping is then used to generate the next generation of mappings and repeat the previous steps. After hundreds of rounds of searching, the best mapping ever known is returned as a final mapping. In experiments, we use three different platforms, including Tensor Core GPU, AVX CPU, and DOT GPU. For baseline, we compare to leverage. We use PyTorch to invoke QDN, Glass and Catalyst. We also compare it to other compilers. The compilers use different our techniques in optimization. Also, TVM uses a manually designed templates, and so only supports the general purpose hardware. A unit uses a templates and only supports gen and 2D convolution. AKG uses a polyhedral model. As for benchmark, we use 15 different operators that are widely used in machine learning. On tensor core GPUs, we compare the performance of all the 15 operators to PyTorch, and the average speed up is more than 2.5 times. We also compare to four different compilers using 2D convolution, and the speed up to auto TBM is 1.3 times, the speed up to answer is 1.79 times, and the speed up to unit is 4.96 times. EKG fails in more than half of the testing cases due to internal errors. AMOS can achieve good speed up because of two reasons. First, AMOS enables more mappings for these operators thanks to our systematic mapping generation, validation, and exploration. In this table, we show the number of mappings found by AMOS for each operator. Other work that use a template and a library can't explore so many mappings as AMOS. And the second reason is that AMOS is more flexible. Templates and libraries are fixed and can't adapt to the different input shapes. We perform an ablation study and force AMOS to use fixed mappings. The performance drops by more than 13%, which reveals that the flexibility is the source of the speed up. On other platforms, AMOS also achieve better performance. On AVX CPU, the speed up to TVM is 1.37 times. And on Mali GPU, the speed up to auto TVM is up to 25 times. In summary, we propose a framework AMOS that uses a hardware abstraction to represent different intrinsic in a unified manner. 
AMOS can perform mapping generation, validation, and exploration to achieve high performance on various accelerators. Our code is also open source. Feel free to download our code on GitHub. That's all. Thank you. Uh, do we have the speaker online? Yes, I'm online. Okay, okay. all right. So I asked a question. Um, so it seems like a lot of really impressive results, by the way. Um, is there any key insight why uh, Amos is able to capture more mappings than uh, the prior work? Is it is it how you actually capture the set of hardware intrinsics? Uh, that you'll be able to capture more um, characteristic of a hardware? Like what's what's the key sort of insight that enable more mapping that discovered by Amos? Well, I think the key insight is that we treat the intr intrinsic generation as a loop matching. Uh, the previous work uh, used a templates or the fixed mapping to assign a fixed set of loops to the hardware. Uh, but actually, um, more loops can be uh, mapped to hardware, but they, they don't explore the opportunities. And AMOS express the loops as a first class in our IR, and we can match, uh, we abstract the hardware also in the same IR, so we can perform the matching more flexibly and explore more mappings. And this is a major source of the speed up. Hello all, thank you for... Uh, well. Paper is also... Hello all, thank you for joining my talk today. I am Ali, I am about to finish my PhD at UFT, and today I'm very excited to share my work with Mustafa Amir and Professor Moshevos with you. Maki is a post training for bit quantization for transformer models that allows you to replace floating point operations with narrow fixed point integers. Transformers are the dominating architectures in various NLP applications today. As an example here, I'm showing you a text generation application. Here, I put an input prompt. My name is Ali, I'm a PhD candidate at UFT, and today I'm presenting my paper at ISCA. And I will ask the model to generate a few sentences to complete my prompt. Once I click on the generate text button, it will say, to tell you the truth, I'm nervous, but excited to show, my, to show off my ideas, which is pretty accurate. I wish I would get the visa on time so that I could be in person with you and present my work there. Anyways, so there are a few challenges that motivated us to design Maki. The first challenge is the growth of weights or the number of parameters that we have in attention-based models over time. So from 2018 with about one gigabyte of parameters to 2021 with about two terabytes of parameters in NVIDIA Megatron, we see that the number of weights or parameters that we have in the models has increased by about three orders of magnitude. Beside the parameters, the activations scale with sequence length. And for example, if we have a tweet, if we have a few sentences that we want to run the model on them, the activations would account for about 5% of our overall footprints. However, if we have a few paragraphs, if we have a few papers or chapters of a book, activations would quadratically scale. In this example, with a few paragraphs, activations account for about 80% of our overall memory footprint. So these two are indicating that the memory is going to be our bottleneck for performance and energy. Another challenge is FP compute. 
these attention-based models or transformer models are using floating point computation. And for example, for Megatron, it has about hundreds of trillions of floating point operations just for the inference. And it would be very helpful if we can replace floating point operations with integer or fixed point implementations. Maki addresses these challenges by quantizing floating point transformer models to four bit integer indexes, which will translate to eight times compression for FP32 or four times for FP16 baseline. But Maki is not a typical four bit quantization. Maki is a dictionary based quantization, but very nice thing about Maki is that the dictionary can be represented as a closed form formula of the index. Therefore, it will enable us to do computation directly over indexes without going back and looking up the values. Maki is a post-training method which does not require fine-tuning your model and that is important because typically quantization or model compression methods require you to have access to data sets for fine-tuning which might not be available at all times or they require high-end GPUs or data centers for retraining the model. A post-training method like Maki does not require any of this. Another thing about Maki is that it will replace Mac operations with counting. And you will see that this is going to be very effective in reducing energy consumption of the model. And finally, the computation is done in fixed point domain. We show two use cases for Maki. First, Maki hardware accelerator that compares to tensor core, it can be up to 15 times faster and 100 times more energy efficient. And also, Maki can be used as a memory compression technique along other accelerators to improve their performance and energy efficiency. For the rest of this talk, we are first going to talk about how Maki quantization works, how can we do computation directly on indexes, what is the effect of quantization on model accuracy, and then before going to the conclusion, we will see a few evaluation for our hardware accelerator. Maki at the core is a dictionary-based quantization or clustering method powered by agglomerative clustering. When we quantize a distribution, we get a quantization dictionary. Quantization dictionary provides us some representative values and some corresponding indexes that we can use to transfer our data. Clustering methods are iterative, which makes them slow and expensive for on-the-fly applications. Therefore, they are not a suitable match for quantizing activations which are generated on the fly. To address this issue, we investigated the distribution of values for different weights and activations layers. Let's just focus on the bulk of values. In here, we see that most of the values follow the same bell-shaped distribution. To take advantage of this similarity, we define a normal distribution as our reference. We are going to quantize this distribution to get a quantization dictionary, which we will name Golden Dictionary. The nice thing about Golden Dictionary is we can just scale and shift it to match the distribution that we have in every layer. So for quantizing weights and embeddings, we can do this process offline because we already know all the values before inference. And for activations, we need the mean and a standard deviation for each layer. We can get that mean and a standard deviation by profiling a few values throughout the inference. Now let's talk about what happens during computation. Let's say we want to perform MAC operations. We have one activation, one weight, and we can multiply, accumulate these values to generate our output. If we have a dictionary-based quantizations, for weights and activations, we have two indexes. So the first thing that we can do is to look up these values from our dictionary, and then we perform our MAC operations on the looked up values and compute the output. But in Maki, we want to skip this part. We don't want to go back to a dictionary and look up the values. Therefore, we are looking to find a way that we can somehow multiply, accumulate two indexes, and get our output result. And we will see why this is important in practice. So for our FE16 baseline with no compression, we store all the FE16 values in our DRAM. They can be transferred and stored on on-chip buffers so that they can supply compute units with the stream of FE16 values that they're expecting. 
For a dictionary-based quantization, we can store four-bit indexes, which is four times compression, on our DRAM. And then once we transfer the values from off-chip to on-chip before storing them on our on-chip buffers, we can use a lookup table to look up these values and store FV16 representative on our on-chip buffers. And then we, we transfer these FV16 values for our compute units to consume. The problem with this approach is that there would be no on-chip memory compression in this scheme, which will limit the performance and or energy gain. In another approach, if we want to take advantage of on-chip compression as well, we can store the values, uh, store the indexes on DRAM, transfer the indexes to on-chip buffers, and then once we want to transfer the values from on-chip buffers to compute units, we can expand them to the representative values. But this approach requires many, many instances of lookup tables, which is going to be wasteful in terms of area and energy. So to do computation directly on indexes without using lookup tables, we should find a simple relationship between index and values. So for that, let's revisit our distribution. And as we can see, the reference distribution that we have is symmetrical, which will result in a symmetrical quantization dictionary. So now let's just focus on one half of our quantization dictionary, which has just eight indexes. Now to find the relationship between indexes and values, we are going to fit a curve in form of a to the power of i plus b into our golden dictionary, where a and b are two constants and i is the integer index that we want to use. And you can see using MATLAB curve fitting tool, we can find a curve like this, which approximates our golden dictionary pretty well. As a result, we can represent our values in a four bit format like this. First, we have a sine bit that tells us which side of the distribution we are. And then we have a to the power of i plus b, where a and b are constants. And i is just the index to the golden dictionary. And to accommodate every layer, if you remember, we said we need a shift and a scale. So we are going to add the standard deviation and the mean of every layer in order to fit these values to their distribution. So for simplicity, let's assume that all the values that we have are positive, standard deviation is one and mu is zero. And let's revisit the computation to see what happens if we want to perform computation using this format. So we have activations and weights, and they are all represented into the format of a to the power of i plus b. Now we want to compute our output activation, which is just a multiply accumulation of this. If we multiply and accumulate these values, we can expand them to four terms. So the last term, nb squared, is just a constant that we already know. There is no variable in it. The, the term before that is b times the summation over the exponential part of weights. And that is already known because we have the weights beforehand, so we can compute that term as well. The term before that is b multiplied by a summation of exponential part of the activation. And this term is already known when we are doing this computation because we quantize the previous layer. Therefore, we know what activations we have and we can already compute the sum of the activations before computing this layer. So the only challenging part is this one, which is a to the power of index for weights plus the index for activations. So for that, we know that the index for weight and activation, each one is between 0 to 7. So their addition would be at between 0 to 14. And that will result in 15 unique pairs for this computation. Therefore, we can just count how many times each one of these happens using a histogram. And then using a weighted reduction, we just reduce this to one single number. So as a result, most of the computation can be summarized in just adding the indexes for weights and activations and see which one of these combinations show up. And that will be just three bits of integer addition. And then once you process all the weight and activation pairs, we have a post-processing stage when we reduce these values to a single number. And that happens in 16-bit fixed point domain. So far, we talked about bulk of values. But what if 
we have values that are outliers. Outliers are rare, but they are covering a wide range, and they are very important to maintain the accuracy of the model. To accommodate outliers, we are expanding our indexes in a separate dictionary, and since they rarely show up during computation, we can just look them up from that dictionary and perform our computation. To evaluate or design, we consider an FP16 baseline, and we evaluate a wide range of models on various on-chip buffers and accelerators. For simulation, we are using a custom cycle accurate simulator that uses DRAM SIM3 for modeling of chip traffic. To model on-chip traffic, we use cacti. The synthesis is done in 65 nanometer TSMC technology node using Synopsys Design Compiler. Layout is done using Inovus. Signal activity is computed with model sim and fed back to Inovus for power estimation. This plot shows the effect of quantization on model's accuracy. On the x-axis, we have various models for two tasks, as an example in here, and on the y-axis, we have the score that we get. The darker blue line shows you the baseline accuracy for F3 models, and the lighter blue line shows the accuracy for Maki. And as you can see, Maki can maintain accuracy of the baseline model within 1% error. Now, let's take a look at accelerator's performance. With four times compressions from 16-bit values to 4 bits, you expect to have a ceiling of four times the speed up for your accelerator. That is true if you can fit almost all your activations or weights on your on-chip buffer. However, if your on-chip buffer is limited, you have to read some values more than once from off-chip memory. And this is extremely important if you have tasks with longer sequence lengths. As a result, it can improve the speed up up to 15 times faster for longer sequence tasks. Energy efficiency follows the same trend as performance. And for example, for this 256 kilobyte on-chip buffer, on average, we get 80 times more energy efficiency compared to tensor cores. Maki can also be used as a memory compression technique with other accelerators. For more information about it, please refer to the paper. To conclude this talk, we talked about Maki quantization, which is a 4-bit quantization for both weights and activation. And the nice thing about it was it focuses on a subspace of values where the bulk of values are, and it can represent those dictionaries with a closed form format. We take advantage of fixed point computiness, and everything is post-training. We do not require any fine-tuning for the model. Also, we introduced Maki Hardware Accelerator. We take advantage of Maki computation to perform computation directly on indexes. It has an area-efficient design that can make the inference faster and more energy efficient. Thank you for listening to my presentation, and I would love to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Thank you for your talk. Uh, I wonder what would happen if the values that I have in, an, in hand is not so much always Gaussian dis distributed, maybe uniform, and maybe some other distribution, then how would that work? So thank you for your question. Uh, for the models that we tried for attention-based models, almost all the layers have... This, is this speaker online, right? Can, can you hear me? Oh, oh can you unmute? Uh, I'm on mute. Hello? Can you hear me? <laughs> he already oh, answered your question, but can you hear me? Okay, okay, okay. The, the, the fun, fun of hybrid conference. conference.
Can you hear me? Can you hear me? So, Ali, Ali are you on? on? He's on. Okay, so can I answer the question now? Okay, so to answer the question, um, the models that we focused on were NLP models, and these models uh, all have the same Gaussian like bell shape distribution. So the point that we want to see in a model to apply a method like Maki on that is uh, most of your values are densely populated in some area and the rest of the values are like spread in a wide range. And that's where Maki can be useful. So it really doesn't matter if it's a Gaussian or a Laplace or a different kind of distribution. It really wouldn't make sense to do some, this kind of quantization for like a uniform distribution, probably linear quantization would work better on that case. But uh, most of the models that we tried have this kind of property and Maki works well on them. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank that was you. a really good really talk. Really good talk. Uh, I have a question uh, about uh, 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 um, emerging uh, number uh, formats. I was wondering uh, if you had a chance to look at things like block flow or adaptive flow instead of floating point as the baseline and see if the quantization works there. Or is that something you are interested in looking at in the future? So uh, yeah, definitely we will look at that for the future, but our approach was to just uh, get models that are ready for inference from, for example, hugging face model hub, just uh, quantize them and see what can we do with them. So yeah, definitely there are different things that we can do. Uh, we were just focused on uh, getting FP models that are ready to use and uh, have a model to quantize them. But yeah, definitely that's a good approach to look at for the future. All right, thanks, All right. thanks, thanks, the speaker. thanks the speaker. Thank you. All right, um, last paper of the conference. <laughs> Our speaker is uh, Amir from Google Research. Uh, he's working on accelerating machine learning models uh, with the uh, new hardware and systems design. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ninja. Hello, everyone. Um, I remember when I presented uh, my first work at ISCA 2014 on analog uh, uh, TPU, analog um, MPU. Uh, my talk was the very last talk. And um, again, here I am. The very last talk, and it seems PC, uh, ISCA PC has this tradition to save um, last for the best. Um, joke aside, um, I'm very happy to be back after the pandemic presenting our work on uh, how to leverage machine learning uh, techniques to accelerate uh, attention based models. I think the prevalence of um, self attention models uh, does, not need, does not require too much uh, motivation. These days, we see attention-based models almost everywhere, uh, from machine translation, document summarization, and even these models are replacing the conventional CNN models and become the de facto standard uh, for image classification. Self-attention mechanism uh, basically calculate a correlation score for each word or token with respect to the other word, uh, words in a, in a sentence or in an, in an image. But what does this uh, self-attention mechanism perform at uh, its core? There are three main matrices, query, key, and value, um, that are contributing to the calculation of the attention. These matrices are kind of abstraction that are useful for calculating attention and thinking about attention in general. Let's go over the computation a little bit at a very high level. The first step in calculating self-attention is to calculate a score. The score basically determines how much focus to place on other parts of the input, um, input, of the sen input sentence 
as we encode a word at a certain position. The score is calculated by taking the dot product of the query vector with the key vector of the respective word um, we are scoring, basically. Then in the second step, we pass the results of the score matrix through a softmax operation. Softmax basically normalizes the, the scores so they are all positive and add up to one, basically converting the scores to a probability vector. This softmax score determines how much each word will be expressed at a particular position. The third and final step is to multiply each value vector by the softmax uh, score. And the intuition here is to keep intact the values of the words we want to focus on and drown out irrelevant, uh, irrelevant words. Basically, we multiply it by a very, very small number. 0.0001. So it should be clear by now that the end-to-end self-attention mechanism contributes to a large portion of the total runtime, uh, corroborating prior work as well. So I picked this vis visualization from an open source project because first, I think it's cool. And then I think it helps to better understand what is happening under the hood. Um, here you can see the query and key and the corresponding computing scores. Um, as you can see here, um, highlighting the uh, keyword there, the blue one, it shows that only few keywords define the context of the whole sentence. And not only that, but also most of the score values are inconsequential, which obviates their computation. Okay, what do we have here? Our opportunity here is the existence of the significant inconsequential computations. But how can we identify and eliminate these inconsequential computations? We realize that there exists a threshold that differentiates between the scores of the words that needs to be considered for the context and those that do not define the context and are thus inconsequential that could save unnecessary computation overhead and therefore accelerate self-attention. But however, the challenge that um, exists here is how we can identify and find this threshold while maximizing pruning rate. And also we are, we are interested in a solution that has minimal repercussions for model accuracy. So the main contribution of this work, which we call it LEPARD, uh, are first, we formulate the threshold selection as a differentiable regularizer. This formulation leverages the gradient-based backpropagation algorithm to mathematically co-optimize the threshold values and weight parameters um, of the model without any approximation involved. Second, uh, we proposed and designed an exact beat serial architecture to enable an early termination on top of pruning with, ex uh, with exactly no repercussions for the model accuracy. Let's discuss these main uh, contributions in detail. As we discussed, we would like to find uh, a threshold below which all the scores uh, are set to a large negative value, the minus K there. Um, and these values become insignificant after softmax operation. The score values above this threshold, those, those are the scores that define the context and we are keeping them and unchanged. But what is the problem here? Using this pruning operation or thresholding operation as part of a gradient-based training method is not as straightforward, obviously due to the discontinuity at the vicinity of the threshold, huge jump. This discontinuity not only prevents the gradients to flow throughout their network, but also this quick jump from a large negative number minus K to a, to a positive, positive value could add significant noise to the training process. So how do we solve it? On the right side, uh, to circum circumvent this non-differentiality in the pruning of operation, we propose to replace this operation with an approximate function that mimics the original threshold operation, as you can see. 
I'm not going to go into the details of mathematical operation uh, formulation here uh, for this soft threshold approach, but I think it should be clear how this soft threshold would help the learning process. Supporting the learning gradients to flow through this, uh, to flow through the, out the network at the vicinity of the threshold allows the gradient-based learning algorithm to either push down the model parameters below the threshold or lift them above the threshold according to their uh, contributions to final model accuracy. But let's think about it. Is this soft threshold formulation sufficient? If you recall, I told you that we are interested in a solution that yield a higher sparsity rate. We want the person to be happy because that means higher efficiency, faster and better energy efficiency. But as you may know, gradient-based training always relates to incentives. We have to somehow tell the learning method that what we want. For example, in a conventional way, we all know that in a neural network training, we have a loss function and we enforce the model parameter to lift the model accuracy, basically minimizing the loss. Intuitively speaking here, if we only use the soft threshold, the previous slide, the training method may just simply lower the threshold to a very, very small value, which translate to lower sparsity to maintain high model accuracy because that's the, or, uh, that's the only incentive in the loss function. But this is not desirable for us. We want an incentive. We want a constraint to strike a balance between model accuracy and higher sparsity. So in the machine learning area, it's imposing such constraint to gradient-based methods are generally achieved through adding a regularizer term to the loss function. A common regularizer that would be helpful for us here is to use a L0 regularizer. How does this regularizer would help? It could count the number of scores that are above a certain value and tries to minimize them as part of the loss function. Basically what we want, we want the less number of green circles uh, in our, uh, which, represent the which rep represent the scores in the, in the uh, figure basically. But here we have the same problem um, as the uh, sim similar problem as the thresholding. L0 regularizer is also non-differentiable. To circumvent this, we propose and use a surrogate L0 regularizer that is indeed in, uh, differentiable. We use a steep sigmoid function, green curve there. Uh, at a very high level, the role of this sigmoid function, a uh, sigmoid operation, is to render all the scores that are beyond the threshold to one, and the ones below the threshold to zero, basically mimicking the behavior of L0 regularizer. Now that we discuss our differentiable approach for pruning, let's take a look at the bit serial early compute termination process. Remember, we mentioned that we are interested in a solution that does not impose any additional approximation to prevent any repercussions for the model accuracy. Please bear with me with this slide. I hope I can do a good job explaining the process with an example. Here I'm showing the flow for a query and key dot product computation, each with four elements. K elements, the uh, key values, uh, are placed in bit serial format vertically from most significant to low significant. Whereas Q values on the bottom are uh, stored in full precision fixed point format. In this example, we set the threshold value to be five. Let's also define some contracts between each other to keep the simple simple. We assume that the computation is performed in a sign magnitude form, where Ks represent the sign bit for each element of K, uh, in key vector, and the absolute values of K elements are less than one, just for the simplicity. With these contracts in place, let's go over the computation cycle by cycle. As you can see, the first column of the table represents the partial sum values after each cycle. It means that one bit of K multiplied by Q, um, query vector. 
The second column represents a value that we call it conservative margin, and I will get, uh, get to it. Finally, the last column shows whether we can terminate the computation early. What is this conservative margin? This conservative margin is adjusted at each cycle to accommodate the largest pos possible positive com contribution to the final value of the score. And what is our intuition here? The intuition here is that, the, uh, that only the multiplications of elements with concordant signs, positive, positive, negative, negative, can contribute positively to the final dot product value. Multiplication of elements with opposing signs are ignored to keep the margin as conservative as possible and eliminate wrongful early compute termination. Remember, no approximation here. So let's go uh, for the first cycle. In the first cycle, the partial sum is zero. We haven't done anything. It's just a sign. And the conservative margin value is 12.25. So we add the partial sum value with this conservative margin. Uh, it's above the threshold. We cannot terminate the computation. We move on to the next cycle. In the next cycle, the partial value is minus one. As I mentioned, the conservative margin is now updated. The value is 5.25. We add them together. The value will be uh, 4.25. It is below, below uh, threshold. Ta-da. That's it. We, we don't need to continue the computation. We can save the rest of the computation and um, move on to the next uh, computation of this, this score. Okay. I have to go a little bit faster. Okay. I'm going to briefly also talk about our uh, bit serial architecture. Um, so um, it con it's constituted of two, two parts, front end and back end. Front end is responsible to calculate the um, Q multiplied by K and comparing with the threshold. And uh, let's see. Yes. Uh, so we have this predefined learn threshold. We already put it in the, uh, on the accelerator. And if the calculated value is below this threshold, we just simply discard them. We don't send it to the back end. What happens to the ones that are above the threshold? What we do, we send it to the back end for softmax calculation and a score, a score value computations, basically. So this operation. So remember, the back end only performs the operation for unpruned values, unpruned at, uh, attention scores. Okay, let's review our evaluation methodology. I'm already uh, 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 more than 15 minutes. Okay, so um, we evaluate uh, our approach across different model from hugging and faced uh, with a uh, number of parameters from eight, 86 million to 774 million. Our, um, our fine tuning approach is only five epochs, very short for threshold finding. And finally, we can compare with conventional method, A3 and SPADEN. Also, we have our um, synthesize our uh, accelerator uh, with TSMC 65 nanometer, and that's the area. So overall, compared to a baseline methods, which doesn't have any of these pruning and early bit termination, we get 2.3x speed up and 4x uh, energy reduction. Comparing to the prior work in terms of throughput and area efficiency compared to A3, which is, which, which is an approximate actually approach, uh, we get 4.4x throughput and 8.8 uh, area efficiency. For SPADEN, we get 1.6 uh, throughput and 2.3x area efficiency. In terms of pruning, uh, we get from 60% to 92% pruning ratio. This is the average. Uh, and of course, it's dynamic. So we average across multiple iteration with less than 0.2% uh, percent accuracy degradation on the model. In conclusion, in this presentation, we learned that dynamic pruning and thresholding is a promising solution to mitigate the quadratic overhead of self-attention mechanism. I discussed how we can formulate finding the pruning threshold as a differentiable regularizer, enabling us to mathematically co-optimize the threshold values and model parameters. We also talked about bit serial architecture and its exact 
early termination mechanism to further improve the efficiency of our accelerator. To summarize the result, our approach can significantly prune a variety of modern deep learning models with notable benefits in terms of speed up and energy efficiency. We believe that the application of the proposed mathematical formulation of identifying threshold values and its integration into the training loss is broad and can potentially be adopted across a wide range of compute reduction techniques. Thank you for having me here. I know that I am the last person standing between you and lunch. With that, I'm happy to take questions. A question from the audience. Uh, I have a question. Great talk, by the way. Thank you. Uh, very impressive results. I, I, have you thought about how to sort of adapt the pruning techniques so it could be available on the commercial hardware? That's a good question. Um, um, yes, but um, I don't know how much I can talk about it. Mm, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll chat offline then. That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, you for the speaker again. Yeah. Thank you so much. So we're going to have five minutes of a close remark from Muhammad. Okay, I will not take more than five minutes. Uh, just a small uh, remarks here. Oops. Okay, let me. Um, huh? Yeah, it's on. But the first time I speak. Connect with access codes. Yeah. For some reason, it kicked me out. Okay. Let me see. Yeah, you sent me the new link, right? Oops. No, this is not you. Uh, closing remarks. <coughs> Yeah. Yeah, sure. Am I in? Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, it takes forever. So I will share my slides first and then I will share. Okay. So, Recording okay, in progress. Okay. Share. And. Uh, Okay. Hmm. Okay, everybody. Um, we really um, appreciate your attendance until the end. And uh, we are very happy to have you back after two years of uh, online thing. We hope you um, enjoyed ISCA 2022. Uh, there were some challenges, of course, during you know uh, setting up uh, this ISCA uh, that we discussed before. Uh, but uh, we are back in person, and that what counts. We learned some lessons from this experience that will make future ISCAs. Uh, better and we really appreciate your your feedback so feel free to email any of us with any feedback you found the main reason actually there are two reasons one major one minor uh, that i'm giving the closing remarks uh, the main one is that i would like to thank the driving wheel for getting this isca 2022 really to work which are uh, our students at uh, my students and the colleagues students at nyu so I would like, like to join you for an upload to all of them who are doing, getting these things to 
So thank you so much. We are doing all the heavy lifting and we are getting only the credits and the blame, you know, if something goes bad. Um, also, I would like to reiterate and thank all our fabulous organizing committee. They did a great job uh, getting um, the ISCA tour. Um, I was asked to play very few slides, animated slides for the next ISCA 2023. So I will do this right now. Uh, hopefully you will hear the sound uh, for this. If you don't hear the sound, the sound is not important. You can just enjoy the, okay, it looks like. who didn't attend any FCRC before. It's, it happens every four years with several uh, conferences at the same time. It will be 11 conferences next time. So it will be great opportunity, great visibility, and a lot of... Okay. Okay, so that's it. All right, so thank you so much and see you in Orlando next year. Okay. This is the end of ISCA. <laughs> I mean, end of ISCA this year, not end of ISCA in general. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>